Lecture 11 is Confucius versus Marx on society. When the Jesuit missionaries Francis Xavier and Matteo Ricci became the first Europeans since Marco Polo to visit China in the 16th century, they found a remarkably advanced culture there. China was, even then, larger in its population than any of the nations of Europe, or Christendom, and also older than any in the West except Egypt. And in many ways, its civilization was more advanced. The foundation of its cultural identity was Confucianism, which was less a religion than a social morality with a vague religious veneer called the will of heaven. And the Jesuits found its moral values strikingly similar to classical and Christian values, though not quite identical. It looked like a kind of second Aristotle. Aristotle was the most commonsensical and reasonable of all pagan philosophers, and the most useful and easily assimilated by Christians like St. Thomas Aquinas on the natural level, though not, of course, on the supernatural level. And the Jesuits hoped for a new synthesis and assimilation of Confucius, similar to what Aquinas had done with Aristotle. That did not happen, largely for political reasons on both sides. The Jesuits recalled their missionaries from China, and they were forcibly ejected from Japan. It's not so surprising that Confucius's morality is so similar to Christian morality. However you explain it, it is simply a fact that all the great religions of the world have a strikingly similar morality, although they also have strikingly dissimilar theologies. Christian theology centering on Christ is radically unique, radically different from all other theologies. But Christian morality is not nearly that distinctive. For instance, a universal principle of Christian morality is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Confucius also has a universal principle, which is often called the silver rule. It is, do not do to your neighbor anything you would not have him do to you. It is the exact same principle stated negatively. The single most fundamental moral value for Confucianism is jian, which means benevolence or goodwill, which is St. Thomas Aquinas' definition of the most fundamental Christian value, charity, or agape love. If the pre-Christian values and virtues of Confucianism are strikingly similar to Christian values and virtues, the post-Christian values of Karl Marx, in contrast, are even more strikingly opposite to Christian values. All the principles, laws, and suggestions in Confucius's very complex and detailed moral system are part of a single system somewhat like a solar system, like planets orbiting a single sun, which is harmony and cooperation and preserving natural order and peace. While Marx's most basic values are revolutionary and competitive and violent, this is especially true about their opposite attitudes towards the past. Confucius could be called a progressive conservative. He began by respecting and learning from China's classics of the past, from his tradition. And then he applied it anew to the new needs of his changing present situation and to his culture's future. He joined the past to the future and healed the generation gap that was opening up in his day. Marx, in contrast, deliberately increased it. He saw all of human history as oppression and class conflict, and all existing institutions as things to be hated, rejected, destroyed, or forgotten. One of Marx's favorite quotations was the line, the devil speaks in Goethe's Faust, everything that exists deserves to perish. The contrast between Confucianism and Communism is extremely relevant today for both China, the world's largest nation, and America, its strongest opponent. For just as America is now involved in the most serious internal crisis in its history, by increasingly criticizing its own founding and its own founders' most fundamental values, so China is also now involved in the most serious crisis in its history, since communism and its values has largely, but not totally, replaced Confucianism and its opposite values because of the spectacular military success of the greatest mass murderer in human history, Mao Zedong. 
Yet, even though China has an officially communist body, it still may have a Confucian soul, and its rulers are pragmatic enough to make compromises with both Confucianism and capitalism. Many conquerors have passed through China in the last 2,000 years, and each one has dribbled away like water off the back of a duck. Will the Confucian duck survive the communist reign? No one knows. The present is a time of testing, of criticism, of crisis, and of crossroads for both Western and Eastern cultures. So comparing the philosophies of Confucius and Marx is not just an abstract academic exercise for us, it is about our society's future and identity also. Intellectuals throughout modern Western civilization for the last century or two have always gravitated to the left as their default position. And the most total and radical definition of the left is Marxism or communism. The BBC once took a poll of a cross-section of all citizens in Great Britain and asked who is the greatest philosopher who ever lived. And the winner was Karl Marx. I don't think Marx would have won that poll in Russia or in any other nation that had actually tried Marxism and lived through it. This influence continues among intellectuals despite the fact that Marxism has been the most disastrous social experiment in human history. It has been responsible for more murders of innocent human beings than any other philosophy in history. And its economic predictions have been more totally refuted by history than any other. Orthodox Marxist economics has proved to be a disaster everywhere it has been tried, and nearly every historical prediction that Marx made has been refuted by actual events. For instance, communism has not succeeded in advanced industrial capitalist countries like Germany, as Marx predicted, but only and always in poor and backward countries. And capitalism has not collapsed, as Marx predicted. It has thrived and succeeded in mitigating poverty everywhere, even in China. Marx claimed that his philosophy was scientific, as no other was. He claimed to make history a science for the first time in discovering the innermost law of its dynamism, the so-called dialectic of economic class conflict that drives all change. But science relies on facts, on data, and Marx not only ignored all the data, both historical and economic, that didn't fit into his system, but he also deliberately and knowingly used lies and propaganda. For instance, in the Communist Manifesto, he said that the manifesto was being issued after a worldwide meeting of Communist Party members, when there were at that time exactly two members in existence, himself and Engels, his co-writer. He was not only a liar, but a hypocrite. He exalted the proletariat as the saviors of the human race, yet he himself despised the proletariat, never listened to them, he had not a single proletarian friend, and he would not allow them into his group. He also never set foot in a single one of the factories that he excoriated for their exploitation of workers, and he would not listen to anyone who had actually had experience in working in factories. When confronted with the fact of the existence of peaceful and happy non-socialist societies of the past and the present, Marx always interpreted them as, in fact, oppressive, and their citizens as simply stupid and in need of consciousness raising. In other words, revolutionary propaganda. All non-communist happiness was by definition false happiness. All communist misery was really true happiness. Confucius would see here perhaps just a wee little bit of a need for what he called the restoration of proper names. Marx's philosophy is full of not only contradictions to facts, but also logical self-contradictions. For instance, he exhorts the workers of the world to unite under communism, to choose communism over capitalism. But communism teaches that there is no such thing as free choice or free will, since all historical change is totally determined. Another self-contradiction is that Marx's philosophy of human nature was as cynical and pessimistic and egotistic as that of Machiavelli. Yet he trusted that once the communist revolution succeeded, the new rulers would simply give up their power and wither away out of their idealistic and altruistic love of mankind. Even Jesus could not make us all living saints and create heaven on earth. How would communism do that? But this utopian Marxist heaven, of course, has actually appeared throughout the world. 
wherever communism has taken over, in Stalin's Russia, Mao's China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Castro's Cuba, Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam, Kim Il Jung's North Korea, Maduro's Venezuela, all places where there is so much peace and plenty and freedom and happiness that everybody wants to immigrate into these countries and nobody wants to emigrate. Right. If you believe that, I have a timeshare in Florida I'd like to sell you. So in terms of human happiness, Marxism is the single least successful social and political philosophy in history, both historically and logically, and the one most definitively refuted both by logic and by the facts of history. Confucianism, on the other hand, has been the single most successful social and political system in human history. It has held together in relative harmony, contentment, and peace the world's largest nation for the longest time, over 2,000 years. And that did not come easily. Confucius lived during what is called China's period of warring states, a time of many internal civil wars. But once Confucius's reforms were instituted, long after his death, they lasted for over 2,000 years, longer than any other social system in human history. Let's explore the reasons for this contrast. What is the secret of success in Confucianism? Its basic text, the Analects, does not seem to solve the puzzle, but to exacerbate it, for it is the dullest and most quotidian and pedestrian of all the world's religious scriptures. It is full of obvious platitudes. It sounds like the song from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, It's Nice to Be Nice. It sounds like what we learned in kindergarten. It's not revolutionary, romantic, rebellious, or mystical. It sounds stuffy and moralistic and legalistic to most of us modern readers in the West. But could it be that perhaps we have forgotten our moral kindergarten? That those platitudes are the lessons we need the most and forget the easiest and are too proud to return to, like humble little children. There was once another famous moral teacher who said that unless we became like little children, we could not enter his kingdom, and who predicted that the meek would inherit the earth. Is the contrast between the success of Confucianism and the disaster of Marxism an empirical verification of that prophecy? Well, let's look at the contrast between the personalities of these two philosophers. For people make philosophies before philosophies make people. Confucius was humble, modest, gentle, and open-minded. He was a great teacher. One of his traditional titles is simply the first teacher. He was full of respect for both the dead and the living. He had a gentle and ironic sense of humor, and he loved to dialogue with ordinary people. Confucius was Socrates without the syllogisms. Marx was the exact opposite arrogant, egotistic, totally lacking in humor, a bully, a closed-minded ideologue, and never open to dialogue, to listening, or even tolerant of any disagreement, habitually shouting, I will annihilate you, to anyone who disagreed with him. This difference in personality also corresponded to two different philosophies of human nature and of human history. For Confucius, man is a natural growing thing, not an artifact, or a construct of will and ideology. And human history is like the life of a living organism, a plant or an animal. All of Confucius's values are geared towards harmony, harmony between classes and between individuals, because society for him is organic, not mechanical. The harmony and cooperation of its parts and its organs is what keeps any organism alive, and its continuity with its past is essential for its growth. A plant's roots are never its enemies, because a plant is an organism, not a machine or a battlefield. But for Marx, human history is essentially conflict, oppression, and struggle, and it culminates in violent revolution and a utopian demand for radical change and the ripping up of all old roots. This hatred of the past and demand for a revolutionary and violent future has characterized both the revolutionary left and the revolutionary right of the modern West, both communism and fascism. This difference in their philosophies of history reflects a difference in their philosophies of human nature. Confucius had the Aristotelian instinct to always seek a golden mean between extremes, and therefore he equally criticized two one-sided philosophies of human nature that were around in his day as they are in ours. 
On the one side stood Motsu and the Moists, who, like Rousseau, believed that man was by nature good, altruistic, and trustable, and that the feeling of universal love would solve all social problems. On the other side stood the so-called realists, who, like Machiavelli and Hobbes, saw man as inherently selfish and violent, and saw force and fear as the only effective way to improve his behavior. While Confucius embraced a golden mean between the optimists and the pessimists, Marx was definitively in the school of Machiavelli and Hobbes, but without their realism. In fact, he had the most romantic idealism and utopianism like Rousseau, so he had the worst of both worlds. Christ, by the way, was not a Moist or a Rousseauian, as Nietzsche mistakenly thought. He told us to be harmless as doves, but also wise as serpents. He did indeed see mankind as potentially good, far more than his contemporaries did, but he also saw them as corrupt and evil, far more than his contemporaries did. His fiery forerunner and cousin and friend, John the Baptist, whom Jesus labeled the greatest of the prophets, was far from a Motsu or a Rousseau. And so was the man who overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple and attacked them with a whip of cords. The opposite social and political programs of Confucius and Marx were based on their opposite attitudes towards the past. Confucius was concerned to maintain continuity, Marx to eliminate it. Confucius began with trusting tradition, Marx with distrusting it. Confucius wanted to minimize the dangerous generation gap that was opening up between the old and the new in his century, the 6th century BC. Marx wanted to increase it and to use it to foment the revolution. So he supported all revolutions, even non-Marxist ones, because they destabilized the existing order, all of which for Marx had to perish. The crisis Confucius faced, this generation gap, was happening all over the world at the same time, as the whole human race was apparently entering its teenage stage of self-consciousness and self-doubt and questioning. The 6th century BC is called the axial period of history because it was as if human consciousness was turning on its axis. The crisis produced new sages everywhere, all of whom demanded more deliberate and internalized and mature versions of their traditions. The early Greek philosophers, the Hebrew prophets, the writers of the Bhagavad Gita in India, Buddha, Lao Tzu. Confucius's work performed the same task as theirs, to embrace the values of the past and the ancestors, but in a new, more free, more individual, more rational, more conscious, and more deliberate way. In other words, to be both conservative and progressive. I think that one of the reasons Marxism was so attractive in our time is that revolution and war and violence, however evil they are, and whatever evils they bring, seem at least much more interesting than peace and harmony and cooperation and moderation and compromise. But this is an illusion. Peace is really much more interesting than war, and life is more interesting than death, and cooperation is more interesting than conflict. A conservative train that succeeds in staying on its traditional tracks and succeeds in taking people long distances to their desired end is really more remarkable and more interesting than a progressive and revolutionary train that goes off the tracks. Standing upright is more interesting than falling down, whether you fall forward or backward, whether to the right or to the left. Playing the right notes is more interesting than slamming your fist down angrily and at random on the keyboard. Another separation and dualism that Confucius overcomes is the one between individuals and society. Like Plato, he sees individual virtues and social virtues as identical, no double standard, because society is made by and composed of individuals, and individuals are formed by society. And this is true of society at all levels, beginning with the family and completed with the nation. And the individual is the source of the social for Confucius as it was for Plato, whereas in Marx it is the opposite. For him, the individual is totally formed by the state rather than vice versa. The issue here is the identity of the first cause. For Marx, it is the economic structure of the political system. For Confucius, it is the human heart. 
Confucius taught, if there is benevolence in the heart, there will be harmony in the household. If there is harmony in the household, there will be order in the state. If there is order in the state, there will be peace in the world. In Marx, we see still another non-Confucian conflict and contrast between the end and the means. For Marx, the social and political end justifies means that are its opposite. Peace comes only through war. Equality comes only through class conflict. Life comes only through eliminating the enemy. Justice comes only through injustices. And equality comes only through an elite. George Orwell shows this irony with delicious and bitter wit in Animal Farm, where all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, and in which war is peace and freedom is slavery. For Marx, ethics is simply the rationalization of the social and political power structure. It is appearance rather than reality, like the icing on the cake or the veneer that masks the furniture. In ancient Rome, wax was used to mask defects in the wood, so good wood was advertised as without wax. The Latin for those two words is sine sere, from which we get our word sincere. For Marx, as for Sartre, ethics is essentially insincere. He calls ethics and religion and philosophy the mere superstructure rather than the structure. The structure is always matter. The superstructure is mind and thought. Thought is, for Marx, only an epiphenomenon. That means an effect, but not a cause. It simply passively reflects whatever has the power to make the laws. Of course, he makes an exception for his own thought. This relativism and subjectivism of thought is the same idea that was taught in Socrates' day by the sophists, like Thrasymachus in the Republic and Callicles in the Gorgias. For Marx, since there are no universal and unchanging values, there can be nothing universal or common to both feudal values and capitalist values, or common to both capitalist values and communist values. He says that different economic systems produce radically different values because they produce radically different human natures, different species, almost like Nietzsche's overman. Humanity, in other words, is malleable, like clay. There is no such thing as a universal and unchanging moral value because there is no such thing as a universal and unchanging human nature. So all the sages are wrong. Greek, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, and Confucian. There's nothing like a natural moral law. Now let's look at Confucius's version of the natural law. We instantly perceive its similarity to the Christian version. The five great virtues of Confucius are all concepts that are richer than any single English word that can translate them. They are jian, chunsu, te, li, and wen, all words of one syllable. The first and most fundamental value, jian, is the fundamental person-to-person -person value in Confucianism, and it means essentially goodwill or benevolence which is, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, the essence of Christian charity, or agape, which he defines as the will to the good of the other. It is not a feeling, since feelings cannot be commanded, or a specific deed, since deeds can be done by machines as well as by persons, but it is a general motivational principle of will that logically entails good deeds and forbids bad ones to everyone. It is summarized in what has been called Confucius's silver rule, the negative corollary of the golden rule, to love your neighbor as yourself, or to do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Its primacy and universality is signified by the fact that the ideogram, or written character for it, is simply the combination of two and man. Confucius's second value, Chun Tzu, is the concretization of Jen, the incarnation of Jen in the saint. It means literally the large spirited person, the one who makes room in himself for others and their needs, a hospitality of the heart manifesting itself in a hospitality of the house and of the hand. It means habitually taking responsibility for others' happiness. Paradoxically, its largeness is a kind of smallness or humility for its opposite, the small spirited person, thinks of himself as large 
as the deserving, important center of the world who should be served rather than serving. It is the exact opposite of what we teach our children. In the words of the opening song of an animated children's TV show, the most important person in the whole wide world is you. As a Christian, I label that spiritual child abuse. The third Confucian value, day, flows from the Chun Tzu as sunlight flows from the sun. It means spiritual power or the power of moral example, a kind of spiritual gravity. A Christian example of it is the power of Christ's personality and words. For example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the angry mob fell back at his simple and fearless admission of his identity, or when the soldiers came back without him to the Jewish authorities who had ordered them to arrest him, saying, no man ever spoke like this man. And he spoke with authority and not as the scribes. It is the old, gentle, spiritual notion of authority. It's not the typical misunderstanding of authority that confuses it with power, that says that might makes right. Rather, it is the right that makes its own might. The fourth value, Li, means propriety or fittingness or appropriateness or good manners. It combines ethics and art or aesthetics. Like the Greek word kalon, which means the noble or the beautiful and the good. In the Analects, Li includes many apparently fussy rules for treating different people and situations in different ways, like the rules of a complex game, like baseball, or like the steps of a complex dance. We informal, casual Westerners usually feel this as stuffy and legalistic and artificial, but Confucius felt it as exactly the opposite, as natural and habitual, a work of art like a dance or a song or a formal Victorian dinner. Miss Manners, who wrote the newspaper column about propriety, was not a philosopher, but she was a good psychologist. She knew how powerful an aid to morality good habits were. Aesthetic habits of social propriety are the seeds or the fertilizer or the food for good moral habits, just as beautiful music is like fertilizer for good morality. Plato, like Confucius, saw this very clearly. Probably the single most important kind of Li, or rightness, for Confucius is the rightness of names. He said that the very first step in restoring harmony in life is the restoration of proper names. The Greeks defined man by language. Man was zoon echon logon, the animal that has words. Knowledge and wisdom die if they cannot live in their proper houses, which are the right words. Concepts that do not have words to live in have a very short life expectancy, rather like homeless people who do not have houses to live in. The totalitarian dictators in Orwell's 1984 understood that principle very well. That's why they demand to control language, to erase old politically incorrect words, and to invent new politically correct words. Does that sound dangerously familiar? If you can't say it, eventually you can't think it. And if you can't think it, you can't get it or do it or realize it. The fifth value, when, or the arts of peace, are a corollary of Li. Art was so important to the ancient Athenians that they rewarded those who wrote the best plays with free room and board for life in the town hall at the center of the town. That's how valuable they thought good art was to the good society. Modern Europeans and Americans, instead, expect their artists to be starving rebels on the outs of society, both physically and spiritually our artists are almost never conservative. Confucius understood the power of art, like the Scottish writer and politician Andrew Fletcher, who wrote, let me write the songs of a nation and I care not who writes its laws. Is that silly? Well, ask yourself, who has the greater day or power over your hearts, lawyers or musicians? Confucius knew nothing of art for art's sake or art for personal entertainment. Art was a social necessity because of its power, especially the art of music. Confucius was once so moved by a piece of music that he could not eat for three days. 
when is like Li in that it trains the emotions as the raw material or seedbed for trained moral habits. In contrast, Marxism and fascism both have always produced politically correct ideological art that is impersonal, ugly, uncreative, and aggressive. In this way, as in many others, Marxism and fascism are philosophical brothers under the skin, despite their vehement political opposition to each other. The art of both has been the art of war rather than the art of peace. In fact, Marxism is the opposite of all the Confucian virtues. It usually regards good manners and propriety, what Confucius called Li, as decadence. It regards the personal altruism that Confucius called Yen, or benevolence, as weakness. It's too materialistic to even comprehend the notion of spiritual power, what Confucius called Te. And it is too utilitarian to admire the ideal of the spiritually large person, what Confucius called the Chun Tzu, the person who is hospitable and humble, who makes room in himself for others, who is open to dialogue. What I've said about communism is also true of fascism. Both Marx, the hero of communism, and Nietzsche, the hero of fascism, were spiritually small and shouting and bullying and threatening. They were examples of Machiavelli's philosophy that it is better to be feared than to be loved. Let's try to understand why this ugly philosophy seemed so attractive in the 20th century and still does to so many Western intellectuals. What is the spiritual horsepower that gives power to the engine of Marxism? Clearly, its power is in practice rather than theory. And in practice, its negative critical half, its attack on not only capitalism but the whole Western tradition, rather than its positive utopian alternative. Marx wrote in Savage Songs, I shall howl gigantic curses at mankind who are apes of a cold god, and longed to hear heavenly harmonies when the inflamed masses scream and self-consciousness is hanged on the lamppost. Marx reduces everything to matter and everything material to economics, to money and possession and power, the means of production of material wealth, and this exaltation of economics clearly had close connections with his own spectacular incompetence at handling money, as his hatred of the Jews had close connection with their competence and success in this art. He wrote, money is the jealous God of Israel. Marx was not a racist like Hitler, but he hated the Jews almost as much. He wrote, the emancipation of the Jews is the emancipation of humanity from Judaism, from huckstering and money. He predicted that the communist revolution would make the Jew impossible. That was another final solution to the Jewish problem. Marx, like Nietzsche, who criticized the will to truth, derided the notion of honesty and humility before the truth. He classified his writings not as science, but as propaganda. In his own words, not an anatomic knife, but a weapon. Its object is its enemy, which it wants not to refute, but to destroy. He famously dismissed all philosophy, saying that the philosophers have only interpreted the world. The thing is to change it. Like Bacon, he put power, not truth, on the throne. His theoretical philosophy is summarized by the two words dialectical materialism. The dialectic was the structure of opposition that moved all of history, a kind of cultural warfare that prevented any establishment that occurred before communism conquered the world from being stable and peaceful. And his materialism, like that of Hobbes, was consistently applied to all areas and excluded all religion as the opiate of the people, all gods, and all notions of a spiritual soul and an afterlife. It also excluded free will, free choice, and morality, and substituted determinism, a kind of predestination from below, from material forces, and among human beings, economic forces, instead of Calvinism's predestination from above. Materialism is his philosophical weapon, and he applies it to everything. He deduces its consequences logically, but it is his premise rather than his conclusion. He does not prove it. It is a faith. One may justify calling it a religious faith. 
Materialism is in fact easily refutable. It is self-contradictory. First of all, materialism is an ism, an idea. The idea that there are no such things as ideas is self-contradictory. And therefore Marx modifies this by admitting the existence of ideas, but claiming that they are only effects and never causes, that they are wholly determined by material events. This is called epiphenomenalism, the modification of materialism that admits that ideas and culture in general do appear as phenomena, but claims that they do not cause any effects or make any difference in the real world. They are like the heat generated by the electricity that runs along a wire and turns on an appliance. The electricity does all the work, and the heat does nothing but dissipate in the air. It is like the puff of smoke that comes out of the car's tailpipe. They do nothing to move the car. They are simply waste products. They are like a fart of the brain. I choose my words carefully. Marx deliberately insults all spiritual reality, and this insulting philosophy should have an insulting name if we are to call things by their right names, as Confucius says we should do. But if ideas cause nothing, what could be caused by Marx's ideas? Ideas are all he has. He doesn't have any soldiers or money or political power. Marx expects his ideas to cause a worldwide revolution. But ideas, according to his own idea, can only be effects, not causes. Effects of what? Of economics. The economic class of the thinker which for Marx was not the proletariat, but the bourgeoisie, his favorite curse word. There is a very strong argument from analogy against materialism. It is an argument from all the rest of our experience. In all cases, whenever we find an idea that we believe is caused by strictly material factors, which possess no reason or consciousness, we always dismiss that idea as worthless. For instance, suppose someone believes that a large black dog wants to kill him. And when we ask why, we get no reasons, but only irrational causes. He was bitten by a large black dog when he was a baby. So we rightly discount his belief. Or when someone claims to have a mystical experience of God in heaven, and it is found that a bit of bone is pressing on the frontal lobe of his brain while he is having this mystical experience, we rightly dismiss his claim to have seen God and heaven. If materialism and determinism are true, and I can't help how my tongue happens to wag, there is no reason to believe what I say. We do not read a book caused by an explosion in a print factory. All this makes for a great puzzle. Why, then, is Marxism so politically powerful if it is so philosophically weak? Why did it control half the world for a while? Why is a modified form of it still the default position of so many Western intellectuals? The reason cannot be either logical or historical. On the one hand, as we've seen, the logical basis for Marx's basic premise of materialism is weak at best and self-contradictory at worst. And it is humanly insulting. It reduces us to apes with better computers in our heads. And its practical historical consequences are incomparably bad. No other philosophy has ever been responsible for nearly as much human oppression and misery as this one, which claims to save us from the oppression and misery that constitutes all of human history, according to Marx. So what makes Marxism so popular? The only answer that makes sense to me is Nietzsche's. It is Nietzsche rather than Marx who shows us the psychology behind Marxism's attractiveness. It is the will to power which Nietzsche saw as the single most fundamental moving force behind history and human life. When we are forced to choose between truth and power, we're strongly tempted to choose power. The sick and suffering want anesthetics, not philosophy. They want drugs, not sermons. Bacon had defined the new summum bonum of modern culture as man's conquest of nature. And Machiavelli had given us practical rules for the conquest of men, and Marx gives us the propaganda for his movement to conquer the world. Come jump aboard the juggernaut that is destined to conquer the world. Cut down all hierarchies. Bring down all your superiors. Let your envy enforce absolute equality. Substitute the pronoun we for the pronoun I, which is the image of God, and do what Jesus could not do. Become the savior of the world, the real world, the only world, the one that is now oppressing you. That's his propaganda. 
Hitler was also a master propagandist who played on the hate and fear and envy of his people. In fact, the German people's fear of communism was the primary motive for their embracing Hitler. The difference between the far left and the far right, between communism and fascism, between international socialism and national socialism is very small indeed compared to their underlying agreement. Marxism, like fascism, another philosophy with incredibly weak rational credentials, is like a nuclear weapon that all the have-nots are tempted to long for. It has great destructive power, and we are in the grip of our own will to power that tempts us to look at power, not truth, at consequences and not principles. What can we do if we are on the way to such a brave new world? We can turn back to Confucius's platitudes, back to what we learned in nursery school and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, repentance and conversion in philosophy as well as morally and religiously. Marxist materialism says these two things are meaningless and impossible. So we can disprove Marxism simply by doing these two things, repent and convert. When you've made a mistake, either on a real journey, on a real road, or in the mind, on a mental road, such as a mathematical problem, progress in your present direction is really regress. And regress to find and undo the mistake is the only real progress. Marx defeated Confucius in China, but Confucius could defeat Marx in America. The philosophy with the label made in the West has corrupted China but the philosophy with the label made in China could save the sanity of America.